When I was a 10-year-old girl, the place you would often find me would be in a walk-in closet in my bedroom. Um, I'd build a lair for myself, my head on a pillow. I would be buried in books. I really liked boys' books because they were doing adventurous things. They were discovering treasuries, sailing ships, and so on and so forth. While I thought girls' stories were really kind of boring. I uh, knew, even, even at the age of 10 years old, that I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know what I wanted to write about, but I knew that I would one day write. When I was in my mid-twenties, early thirties, I discovered black American writers like Audre Lorde, Maya Angelou, and Alice Walker. Even later, when I was in my mid-thirties, I decided that I wanted to go back to school because I wanted to learn about black culture. So I went to the United States, to UCLA, to get my PhD. This was the first time that I was in class with a black female professor. This was a hugely important moment to me, showing that I could be that too. I too could be a teacher. Finally, I had black female role models. In the Netherlands, I'd never had a black female teacher or professor. And um, now, many years and many books later, I have finally written the book that was waiting to uh, come out of me. The book is called White Innocence, Paradoxes of Colonialism and Race. So what is white innocence? The book is about the Netherlands, and I'm describing and analyzing a favorite story that we Dutch like to tell ourselves about ourselves. In that story, we are a very progressive country. We are the champions of women's liberation, liberation of gays and lesbians. Um, we also like to tell ourselves that we are colorblind and anti-racist. But the thing is that if you would ask this of people who have formerly come from the colonies, people of color, or people from Morocco, or Turkey, or refugees, this doesn't conform to many of their experiences. What I am arguing is that we have a history of 400 years of colonial rule, and that that colonialism has left traces in the Netherlands. These traces are to be found in our language, in our culture, in institutions, in the way we look at ourselves and at others. The traces of these 400 years of colonialism are left in a place that I've called, after Edward Said, the, colonial, the cultural archive. Now people are asking me, so where is the cultural archive? Where can we go to study it? Is it in Amsterdam or is it in Mil Middelburg? Well, the colonial archive is what we have between the ears. It is a space where we have deposited and kept ideas that came into being centuries ago. They have transformed over the centuries, but deeply hidden in those ideas are um, the thought that whites are superior and uh, people of color are inferior. Whites are smarter, more beautiful. Uh, they have the more valued qualities in life. Um, well, maybe except for sexuality, which is something that is often ascribed to black people. So how does that set of ideas manifest today? I will share one example with you. When I was a civil servant early in my 30s, I went to a meeting in the south of Holland, 
and I extended my hand to one of the first men I met in that meeting. Um, he didn't think about it, but automatically turned around, grabbed his coat that he had hung on a chair, and handed it to me. So what is happening here in this moment? Of all the different things I could be to him, the only scenario that he can envision is that I must be the cloakroom attendant. I am there to serve him, to make his life better. I was shocked. I was in dif disbelief. Um, I felt that this is that that was one of the earliest moments that I became aware that there are images preceding me before I have e even opened my mouth. Uh, people have an idea of who I would be. He didn't think about it, he did it instinctively. He had learned that I, looking the way I did, couldn't possibly be his equal. Uh, God has forbid, be his superior, which I was. That was a painful experience. There are many signs of these deep-seated automatic patterns that have taken shape in the Netherlands. Whether it is turning on the television and seeing your own group depicted in a positive way, going to the university and finding courses that are in your field of interest. This is something that whites can take for granted, while blacks cannot. It is a black man who is driving an expensive car who gets stopped. It is a black woman entering an expensive hotel with her white boyfriend who gets taken to be a prostitute. It is when you are trying to get a job, but you have the, the wrong last name, that you won't get selected. So do not even get me started on all the disadvantages that are stacked against black migrant and refugee people. And these disadvantages are connected to that colonial past, when people of color were only fit to serve and to work for white people. This pattern is still very pervasive. It's everywhere. It's in all domains and walks of life. And who dares to raise the issue often meets with rejection, denial, and hostility. I'm getting plenty of hate mail these days since I've uh, spoken out. And even last week, someone was writing to me that niggers like me should shut up and that I'm too stupid to be a university professor. Well, whereas before in my life, I might have been des devastated by this, uh, nowadays I'm at a place where I feel Look, who are you to be telling me this? I have done my PhD at a top university in the United States. I've written several books, one of which has been awarded with the Ruth Benedict Prize of American Anthropological Association. So, you know, I'm thinking, what the hell? As Ellen DeGeneres says, my haters are my motivators. <laughs> Pretty soon, we will be in the time of Sinterklaas and Zwarte Piet again. And this has become one of the hottest topics of debate uh, um, in the past few years, really a sign of polarization. What many people forget is that this Swarte Piet often is the first figure that little children, and certainly this is the case outside of the big cities, this is the first black fig figure that little children get exposed to, even before they can walk and talk. This is a pretty negative image that they get uh, exposed to. Recently, the Ombudsman for Children reported 
that it is especially in this time of year that some children, and I think she meant black children, are bullied and harassed and are feeling very sad in a time that also should be a highlight of their year. It is hard to understand how it can be the case that adults keep on defending this festivity as an innocent children's festivity when it is so clear that some of the children really suffer because of Zwarte Piet. As I hope you can see from these many examples that I'm sharing with you, these colonial ideas are still around. They have transformed, they take on contemporary forms, but one of the important things to hold on to is that this knowledge is not common knowledge. It's often swept under the rug. As I said, people do not like to hear it. Um, and it is the case that um, these ideas are so widespread that even people of color have internalized it, this idea that the Netherlands is a society where there is equality. Um, this is not the case. Race and ethnicity um, really make a difference in people's lives. Um, and if you point this out, you are likely to, to be called a killjoy or even to be called a racist yourself. We need to overcome this white, innocent thinking. If we want to live together harmoniously, we need to get past it. And I am not the killjoy here. How will we reach that situation of overcoming racism? or at least bring it closer. We all need to unlearn this white, innocent way of thinking. And there are different roles here for white people and black people, but all of us need to decolonize our minds. White people need to become more aware of their position of entitlement and privilege. Um, and black people need to be become more self-aware, more self-assertive, and speak out more. A little other story that I want to briefly share. During the research that we did uh, into diversity at the University of Amsterdam, a student of color came forward and told us that during the introductory week at the university, a white fellow student make, made a joke about monkeys and referred it to him. The dark student didn't know how to react. What one of the little steps would be that all of us can get involved with is not to go along with racist or sexist or homophobic remarks when you're a bystander, even though it may be easier and more comfortable for you. We all need to speak up and speak out and interrupt and disrupt such situations. As Elie Wiesel, the World War II um, con concentration camp survivor, has said in Night, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. So I'd like to make a plea against indifference or the thought that this is not something that involves you. So we need to start thinking of a larger we, a we that is inclusive of all of us and that cannot be based on the same gender, the same skin color, sexuality, or beliefs. Change will come from the daily things that we will do for each other, as if the other was, were us, which he is. Do not turn away from injustice. I'm aware that what I'm asking is big, and it will not be accomplished overnight. I know that. 
But I'm convinced this is the main problem that we need to come to terms with at, as a society. When I think back of the role models of my youth, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, I'm confident that they would say that we have to keep walking this path together and that we can accomplish it. What is keeping me going every day and what sustains my courage is the motto of my favorite writer, Audre Lorde, who says, this is a motto hanging above my desk. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. Thank you. <laughs>